Welcome everybody to this iteration of the Wellbeing Culture Forum that we started in 2020 as a response to the pandemic. We started actually as Therme Forum even earlier and we are connected in a, I can say, Hans Ulrich symbiotic relationship with uh, the Serpentine and especially with Hans Ulrich Obrist. Uh, that I don't really need to introduce. Uh, he's the artistic director of the Serpentine Gallery and um, and without him, we wouldn't be here for sure uh, with this talk because uh, he is a great inspirator and um, I think the symbiotic relationship counts also for everybody here coming together to create something that you know nobody could create completely alone, but the thoughts that are connecting us, uh, this is uh, what we will talk today about. Um, and the topic will be how um, an, uh, architecture and design can be actually inspired by neuroscience and, um, and the brain. So I want first to uh, introduce from my side, before I give the word to Johannes Ulrich, uh, to introduce the rest of the panelists, um, Olaf Blanke. Uh, he's professor in Lausanne, he's a neuroscientist, he published a lot about the relationship uh, between the, the outer space, the environment and the inner space that is uh, described through neuroscience and we will be looking very much forward to learn more from this perspective. He's also working very close with Tesh Tadi, the founder of MindMaze and is here um, uh, in the role of an advisor to the company that, that is our joint venture partner and that made uh, the installation here at least the part that is connecting to the brain possible. So, a big round of applause for Olaf Blanke and his participation. <laughs> then I would like to um, introduce from my side uh, Lonika Gordon, that is a friend, I can say. Um, uh, we are like honored to, actually it was her and Ralph uh, Nauta's artwork, um, Franchise Freedom, that actually kicked off our Therma Art program where we really got engaged and we got engaged on a level that I think was more intense that we as a company get ever engaged before in artwork. And through this engagement, um, we are always like asked why we are supporting art and I'm always saying like we are not supporting art, actually art is supporting us, we are learning much more from art, we are getting much more back from art than, than, than we give. So it's actually not a, you know equal relationship, it's actually a relationship where, where we feel really privileged and we are benefiting. So thank you very much Lonike for, for this and thank you also for making this installation um, possible. And um, I, you know, you, you will say some words about Sudo Drift uh, that I don't want to um, advance, uh, but a big round of applause for Lonika. And, and then Francisca, uh, you, you met her already uh, now during this meditation. We are super happy that, that you joined basically the team and that you give a you know, face and a body and a voice to the part where, where it's about guidance, you know? Because how can we enter the space without somebody that, uh, that can help us that already went there and back and back and forth? And um, you're a meditation specialist. I would ask you later also to introduce a little bit your practice. But now a big round of applause from Francesca and for her participation. And now, uh, Hans Ulrich, I would be very happy if you can introduce the other two panelists. Yeah, hello everyone, good morning, and thank you, Mikolai. Thank you so much uh, to all of you for being here uh, in this incredible uh, installation. It kind of feels a bit weird to sit on these chairs because it feels very non-immersive given... Uh, so I think that brings us really to something we've always been thinking with uh, Mikolai about when uh, actually you know, we do panels that they need a special kind of architecture. And uh, it's, of course, something we think a lot about at the Serpentine. You know, in 2006, we worked with Rem Colas and Cecil Balmon on an inflatable pavilion which could somehow leave the park when the pavilion wanted, and then we could pull it back. So, you know, it could be open air, which I think was nice for conferences because we could decide to be outdoors or indoors. As Lina Bobari once said, the indoors are on the outdoors. I think that's kind of interesting in terms of, you know, future spaces where we have conversations. And then, of course, um, as Mikolai said, the partnership with the Serpentine and Terme, we're very grateful for this long partnership. And um, it was a very special moment a few years ago when um, we actually, uh, just after he had done the pavilion in, 
in uh, the Serpentine, we asked Francis Carré to um, develop uh, an architecture just for a conference, you see, and we weren't sitting kind of high up there and then sort of in a way speaking, but everybody was totally immersed with each other. It was a communion, and it led to a really interesting situation because it was no longer this idea of speakers, but like everybody was a participant, and we kind of built a city together. And it was fascinating because, uh, of course, uh, Torquasi was with us uh, as one of the protagonists of this, of this panel, um, and actually also, um, Arthur Jaffa was, uh, was with us, and um, of course, Grace Wells Bonner as well. And um, I remember Virgil Abloh, who was also part of it. Uh, and I, we, we always, you know, I always feel I actually forgot to do it this morning. I'm always myself recording also um, whenever, you know, I'm involved in speeches because you never know if the official recording works. You know, it happens quite regularly. I'm we have five cameras, Hans Ulrich. That, know, that one know, of them will work. You still never know. Sometimes the sound might not work. As you know, Tino Segal once, uh, as actually Jonas Makers once said, digital paranoia. You know, it might, it's always good to have multiple recordings. But the funny thing is that I was like sitting there, like now, and like sort of trying to activate my phone to record it. Um, and then I saw that Virgil did the same thing, right? So he also recorded it on his iPhone. But obviously what I didn't know, what I only found out like at the end of the talk was actually that, um, yeah, that actually Virgil immediately after the conference had emailed it to his group at the AA and uh, had immediately until next Monday a maquette build, right, of the city, right, which we somehow conceived of together. That just shows us, and I'm, I hope something similar will somehow happen today because we always hope in these sort of experiments, you know, with conferences and that they somehow produce reality. And it is, of course, incredibly uh, wonderful, even if I'm uncomfortable on these chairs, it is incredibly wonderful to be in this amazing installation, uh, and uh, which we already spent a lot of time in the day before yesterday, and which is a fantastic device, not only to look at and not only to interact with, with this virtual dimension, but as we could experience just now, thanks to your amazing seance, it's an amazing environment also to to meditate. So thank you so much to Studio Drift for giving us this, uh, this experience. Uh, it's now my immense pleasure to introduce um, uh, actually first Torquasi and then Precious. Uh, Torquasi Dyson, of course, um, uh, is one of the leading artists of our time who, who describes herself actually as a painter who uses the still geometric abstraction to create an idiosyncratic language that is both diagrammatic and expressive. And Torquasi is not only um, a leading artist, but also an architect uh, who actually uh, creates uh, spaces outside, of course, the exhibition space. And um, um, as uh, Ete Latnan says, you know, it's important that we go with art into communities, into cities, uh, which is Torquasi, what Torquasi does. So please give a very warm welcome to Torquasi Dyson. We were also so delighted uh, to have Precious Okoyaman here in Basel, Precious, leading artist of our time, and not only in terms of art, but also poetry, um, uh, uh, very much uh, uh, artist slash poet, poet slash artist, as Lem Sisse said when we curated this exhibition this summer in, in Manchester, and Lem is very right that actually Precious' contribution to the world of poetry is as important as a seminal as the contribution to the visual arts. And I think it's important today, you know, when we talk about healing also, a, a theme which is always so relevant in relation to our conversations with, with Terme, that of course, Precious has just developed with Claude Agil, who is also here. Please give a very warm welcome to Claude Agil, uh, who is the curator of uh, the Serpentine and also the Aspen Museum. And Claude has just curated the show with Precious of uh, a garden, and I think it's, it's interesting, this idea, you know, if we think about Roman Kachanik has written this book, um, How to Be a Good Ancestor, which I recommend to all of you. It's an incredible book where it kind of, you know, Roman Kachanik shows us that we need to go beyond short-termism. And uh, that's, of course, also relevant, you know, in relation to, uh, to design, because to bring it back here to design uh, Basel, to design Miami, because, of course, you know, and so Mari always says, you know, design has to last, and otherwise you have to think about longer durational time frame. Uh, and Farmer Phantasma did this, uh, he had this amazing experience, like working with them at the Serpentine, and Farmer Phantasma actually 
showed us that, uh, you know, like, like fast, I don't know if one says fast design, it's a bit like fast fashion, right? Fast design. And they basically said, you know, if you look like an Ikea chair, this chair would have to last 90 years for it to justify that you use these resources. And they obviously, you know, make clear that the Nikkei chair usually is not used over several generations for 90 years. So the system is wrong. It would be interesting also to know how long we need to use these phones, you know, until it's justified that we use the resources. I mean, it goes without saying that it's certainly much longer than we actually do use them. Um, so in a way, that long duration dimension means, of course, also that we need to go beyond the time frame of event culture, no? And that we need to start to think about longer time horizons, which is why it's so fascinating that artists at the moment think beyond the exhibition. You know, Ottobong Nakanga, who was with us on, on a conference, is thinking about a farm, no? That, not an exhibition, but a farm. Gianfranco Barrucello has done that since the 60s also. And of course, Precious uh, de decided with the most recent project, actually, which Claude curated in Aspen, not to do an exhibition but to do a garden. And of course, a garden brings us beyond the idea of an event because the garden has, has to grow. A very warm welcome to Precious Okoyama. Thank you very much, Hans Ulrich. Um, go beyond the exhibition. I think this is already a very good title um, because the exhibition itself is actually only a rehearsal. The you know forest for change uh, of S. Devlin in the Somerset House. Uh, this forest that she built it in the courtyard. She called it a rehearsal for a new city, and this is very interesting that we cannot you know continue only to rehearse. We have to start to create also an environment where this rehearsal will become reality. We see during the pandemic uh, that the pandemic is actually a symptom of our preconditions, our preconditions that are culturally induced and culturally created. Now, Lunica, um, I want first to, uh, to, to, to ask you, because your practice uh, together with Ralph is actually about observing nature. This is something I think that, uh, especially in the 80s and 90s, we completely forgot. We are observing only ourselves, but not in our true self, but in, in the form of you know, the design that we created, the, the algorithm uh, that created some images on the computer screen. So we observed an artificial world describing it, but we completely disconnected from nature. And now you are coming and you extract the algorithm of bird swarms to create a swarm of drones that is actually performing nature and it becomes nature again. And this kind of connection is obviously a neuronal connection because it's a connection between the nature that we are observing, much more complex than anything we could design, and ourselves. And how this reflects, how this reflects in your work, this interconnection between nature and observation. I think... Um, um our work has always been the result of a desire or a wish to feel in a certain way or to be in a place that doesn't exist or that I wish to exist and actually exists very often in nature. And I think a lot of people experience the same sort of calm or sort of feeling of belonging, sort of feeling of, okay, all the other things don't matter anymore because you feel part of this bigger living entity. And uh, that gives a very good feeling. It puts you in the right perspective of how you see, how you should see the world or how you should, well, that's my opinion, but um, to not center it around yourself or around humans, but around being part of one big living system. And um, I think the, in our practice and, and during the last 15 years, um, we learned constantly by, by picturing and, and not not very clearly trying to mimic nature, but just trying to create a sense of feel. And I could, could never express it. I was always expressing it with my hands or with movement because I can't, I can't uh, sometimes say it in words. I just know how I want to feel. And um, that we found out that always when we then found the right movements and found the right systems to create those movements, they were actually already there and they were already in nature. So it's actually a constant rediscovering of what's already there and what we already know, um, which might feel really, uh, uh, how you say that? Maybe the other way around, but actually that's what it is. And I think that's what a lot of people also feel when they enter the spaces that, that we, we create. And we hope 
to not bring a very clear story or an ID, but we hope to create a place where people can feel this again and actually remember, because this is all in our senses or in our molecules. Uh, it resonates with us and um, that's what we're trying to do. Uh, beautiful. I, I found it so interesting uh, when you told the story how you received the algorithm of the Starlink swarms from the literature of the orientologists and then you programmed this algorithm into the computer to see how it would look like when, when it would be recreated basically and what you saw was that the algorithm was wrong. Yeah, because the orientologist never, maybe you can never recreate it, right? Exactly. So, um, yeah, so we created a, a performance with uh, hundreds of drones and we um, started off with an, an already developed algorithm about uh, bird swarming. And it's very funny because we as artists have to visualize what we do, but maybe scientists, and we can have a discussion about this in, in a little bit, maybe don't always use visualization to see what you're doing is actually a reality. So we, we started off with the algorithm that was developed by a Dutch university, um, visualized it, we didn't change anything on it. And so when you see all the entities swarming around after f three to five minutes, I don't remember exactly, they started to move around in circles and nothing happened anymore. And then we were so surprised, we were like, how come that this algorithm, it finds its balance and it wants to stay there. So what happens actually in real nature? Why does the, do, the, do the birds keep on swarming? It must be, have to do with the constant intertwinedness and, and interchange with the environment and input from the environment. So we started to recreate that by trying out uh, to put obstacles, to put, we, we just started to interfere with the algorithm and visually see until we felt that this was exactly look like what swarming is doing. So I think a lot cannot be put, I mean, there's a lot of, everything is about algorithms at the moment, but I really don't believe in algorithms representing the reality. It's too complex and it goes too far away from what we can understand. We miss a part here. We miss the, the, the way how things feel. We, we, we miss an emotional part in this, and I don't believe in that way in just numbers. But it's interesting because you obviously, you know, use, you use technology um, in, in your work, and um, I wanted to ask you a little bit about that because I had a really fascinating conversation with Pireni Sundalinga a few, a few months ago at DLD, uh, and, you know, Pireni works with uh, Olafur Eliasson on a on the dumb phone. So, not a smartphone, but a dumb phone, the UMB. Um, and it's really interesting because, you know, they say that a lot of the current crisis has to do with this compulsory connection and alienation created through this, you know, and obviously some artists say that, Paul Chan, for example, that we should de-link, right? That we can only, um, be, you know, basically create more holistic experiences if we de-link from technology. But what they actually say, that it's not necessarily about delinking, but it's about, let me find the notes, it's actually about connecting differently because creating a, you know, a connection of depth. Um, and, um, you know, and that, of course, has a lot to do also with, I mean, for example, that, that dumb phone would occasionally just sort of switch off and then you know, create different connections. And, um, you know, and of course, Pirene is a great expert of the, the crisis, the societal crisis, and also, you know, the responsibility these devices have actually for, for many problems in society, because she was advising actually the film The Social Network, you know, and does a lot of research. Um, so I was just curious to hear about how you use technology. And it's not only a question to, you know, you and to the artist, but I wanted also to hear the scientist's kind of point of view on that later. How, how can we sort of change our relationship to technology or use technology in a different way? And of course, there are sort of two possibilities I see. I mean, one is, of course, the old idea of the detournement, right? I mean, Willem Flusso, the philosopher whom I met in the 90s, he said, you know, all of these machines are basically pro programmed and created by the people who develop them for us to use them kind of in the way they want us to use them. So the detournement would be to use this technology in a very subversive, almost anarchic way, in a way, you know, 
that they didn't plan us to use. And the other one is, of course, what Olafur and Pirani do, to just forget about these devices and invent new ones. So I wanted to hear more about Studio Drift's answer to that, or view on that. Um, yeah, that's a good question. Uh, we do use technology, but I think for very different reasons than a lot of technology companies use technology. And technology, everything is technology. A pencil is also technology. There are tools to help with something, right? To, to improve something, hopefully. Why otherwise there is, there is technology? And I think it's all about using things for the right reason with the right intention. And uh, for, for in our process, artistic process, we started to use technology because technology can make something that comes closer to something that feels, feels natural, maybe. And that sounds maybe very weird because you can also just take a walk in the forest, right? And I, I do that also, <laughs> but um, I oh, think... you can't. I mean, that's... <laughs> well, we can, but, but not many everyone can't. Can. Yeah. No, and um, we have created an environment that is without nature, and uh, but we respond to our environment very intuitively and, and non-stop. And how we feel, and at the end of the day or, or after conversation, if we feel drained or if we feel energized, has to do with the other persons around you, but also with the environment. There are some houses where every couple get divorced. There are other places where everyone feels great. There, the, there, there is a huge uh, connection between us and everything around us. And um, I think we use technology as a learning tool and try to figure out at what point it, I respond to technology in an emotional way and in a way that I, uh, it brings me the feeling and emotion that I'm looking for, that I need because I don't get it from the current environment. I'm, I'm integrating it back from, uh, yeah, to, to, to create a new space that feels natural. So, so I like, like, like what you said, um, uh, but because it's this cre cre creative process where you don't control everything because you understand that maybe even most of the things you cannot even see, you know, because, because you described, so our idea of technology is very often, and our idea also of our own body and our own health is very often that we are like a machine where every little part can be taken apart, analyzed and put back together. But in nature the reality is that we don't see and understand most of it. So how can we build a technology? Maybe this is also the dumb phone's real core and also what you described, how we can um, understand algorithms in the part that we know that we can see and understand and how we can still work with it. And, and you quoted one element, it's the sight. It's just looking at something. So understanding something through the recreation and then through the intuitive, um, not understanding but maybe feeling, yeah? And to letting this be a part of our, of our environmental creation and content creation. And here maybe um, I would like uh, to, uh, to, to, to bring the scientist uh, into the discussion, Olaf Blanke. You actually uh, researched a lot about the connection between mysticism and neuroscience. So you published, in, I think it was 2005, an article uh, how the examination of uh, mystic ideas can actually help us to understand our own brain better. And it would be nice if you can tell us a little bit about this research uh, so we can have a kind of scientific perspective and fundament for the next uh, things to come. And I know, Torquas said that, that you are so excited to work with MindMaze and also you have this deep knowledge about exactly this neuroscientific um, topics that um, that's maybe the right introduction also to what we are talking about. Okay, thanks, uh, Mikola. Yeah, I wanted to, before going into mysticism maybe and how that can be a form of relinking, I wanted to go to go back to the, the, the dumb phone idea, which I think is, is fantastic. And I think using technology to relink or, or to delink, and, and but to relink in a different way to technology, whether it's a smartphone or something else, is something we've explored in the lab as you, as you mentioned already about something extremely basic of all of us, what's our relationship with our body, right? I mean, it seems to be pretty hardwired, right? We're all, it's, it's connected, uh, my brain is connected with my body, and that could be perceived as well. That's just what it is. But there's a level of consciousness that comes to it, and how we are aware of our body or not, just uh, the meditation we have done, just take the example of breathing, right? I mean, we have all been breathing just now, 
But in the meditation, it was a very different awareness, right? It's, it's, so you can play with that. And so in that sense, our body is sort of the first interface with nature. It's already part of nature, right? So long sto to make a long story short, so we are interested in this relationship. How is my brain connected with my body? And, and what is that as a first primordial relationship? And we are interested in in this to come up with a different form of self. We briefly discussed about it. So not a cognitive self, a speaking self, a remembering self, uh, uh, very much a feeling self and a seeing self. So one paper we've done uh, uh, launching the, the collaboration with Taj a long time ago was called Video Ergo Zoom. So Descartes famously said Cogito Ergo Zoom, so very cognitive definition, very Western definition of what the self is. I can doubt, I can think that's the self. But we have used actually technology to reconnect with a different, with our body in a different way, using with with mind maze. Um, uh, similar work is is being carried out, using virtual reality and other forms of technology to reconnect, maybe at a distance, with our body. So it's new forms of mirrors mediated through technology, and and so we're working at the interface of, of four domains: psychology, really. That's the consciousness part, and the neuroscience, we're interested in the brain, and linking it since, I think, the, the inauguration, uh, always with technology, because we need that technology, I think, to reconnect in different ways. The mirror was maybe an original technology to reconnect differently with our, our body, right? It was very vision only, and I think the technologies we have today is feeling, vision, we discussed sound and music earlier, to really reconnect uh, differently with, um, with our body. And to, to, I've spoken already for too long, so, so again, that's part of the lab, but with Mind Maze, there is the absolute unique opportunity to, to, to move quickly with these newer coming technologies. So the example we've just seen before is, is a mask, uh, very non-occlusive, but it can tap into certain bodily signals. Uh, that you've used uh, uh, beautifully also, but it can be breathing again. I think it's a, a very interesting uh, example between being stopped and being controlled versus it's always there, it's always ongoing, just like this body. And there's a whole wealth of signals that we have seen that are crucial for this minimal form of self-feeling that we all have. And I think this, this is a way where um, uh, mind maze is going again strongly also in the field of health and, and, and other applications. So can this be applied also to the field of, I think you mentioned it in the beginning, healing um, and medicine. To link back to mysticism, um, this level of bodily self that I've too briefly described and that we look at through technology is at a very important system and all mystics, all great mystics knew this, um, for reaching mystic states. Of course, not eating, not meeting people at all, going to the desert, or going to a mountaintop. These are situations that even today, right, there's a, this retraction from society and a connection with a particular form of nature and environment, right? Can be a forest, can be an ocean, but, but this mystic states, that there needs to be also this element of solitude while being connected with the world around me in a different way. It's a bit like an oxymoron. It's solid connected solitude. It's co socially disconnected, but connected with the physical environment rather with the social. Abs absolutely, but it is, I think a mystic state has a bit this uh, oxymoron element uh, because it's not something you particularly choose. It's something you receive, I guess, letting yourself go in, into that state. But I think it's, uh, it's but there's always the, I think a physical and a social world, and 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 this connection with a with a physical world would be or nature would be would be the key aspect here. And it's interesting because of course mind maze. Uh, you know we've been talking a lot uh, with Nikolai about mind maze and the, you know the human machine interfaces you create with for medical purposes. And I, I just thought it would be interesting in the context of this main question of this morning. You know that what healing solutions can we implement actually to improve kind of any form of building processes, um, I think, you know, you, you, you spoke and you often speak about the impact no VR can have on neurological conditions. And I just wanted to hear a little bit more in a sort of a very practical, applied way, how we can apply this to a greater well-being approach. 
Um, and then also I was really curious um, if there are ways it can actually be introduced as a preventative care. If you can just give a few examples for that, I think it would be really interesting. Yeah, thanks for that question. So uh, with MindMaze, for example, and research in the lab, we've seen that one bodily signal that is, tends to be forgotten is, for example, the heartbeat. Like the breathing, it's always there. And what we have seen, and, and it's actually an, a pain therapy, um, where we're using virtual reality, you would be the patient or, or subject would be looking, a participant would be looking at a hand, not at the real hand, but at a hand in VR, and then an online detected heartbeat, whether with a mask or with a standard ECG, is online detected, sort of the, the, the compression we all feel in our chest is detected, and then we use, we illuminate, or we transform that signal, we reconnect the person in a way with their own hand, but a virtual hand, by illuminating that hand that is painful um, with the heartbeat. And we've seen actually that you can decrease pain using, using uh, such an approach. So this is uh, another form is breathing. So we, we talked again about breathing. It's another physiological thing. So you can also online detect breathing. It's a bit more tricky to detect because it's not like an onset and offset. It's a more pleasing rhythm, you could say. But you can also then illuminate other body parts and it's again you rediscover your body in a different way and that rediscovery is able to override a painful my painful body in that in that case and to give a COVID example um, so we've also used or created scenarios where um, in, in the form of long COVID many people have trouble uh, you know, learning how to breathe again and breathe normally again there's too much attention focused on breathing so we have developed a social therapy if you want, with your own avatar. So it's, it's you, as a, as a COVID patient, you're breathing with your avatar and, and the patient, not everybody loved it, but most of them loved it. Although they're breathing with themselves, it's like, I'm not alone. And there is this, again, there is a loop created via technology with my body in different ways. So these are two examples and MindMaze has other um, scenarios <laughs> where it's, I'm not yet at the preventive part, I realize, but um, where also stroke rehabilitation, there is really no reason why that shouldn't be like a wellness uh, 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 environment. Why do I have to travel so far to get my rehabilitation? What's the VR technology that can be brought to the home of people avoiding two-hour travel in, in, you know, to get half an hour of, 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 of state-of-the-art rehab? So, so it's, these it's are... It's loop healing. It is really... Re it's a dumb phone redirecting you again to, to a in the case of pain to a painful uh, body part. Yes, it's, it's really a, it's a reconnection and a rewriting and a rediscovery of some connection actually which is there, but which has become abnormal or painful in, in this case. And of course, having this more available uh, in early forms of, or, or in a regular encounter in, in the form of well-being and, and other forms of therapy, more like health rather than medicine, I think is also a potential um, uh, which might miss, but also in, in for, for, for as a basic research question, we are very interested. How how can this be achieved? Actually, What's because all of what you just said, why do I have to travel so far to get my rehabilitation? You can also translate why do I have to become sick first before I'm getting my rehabilitation? Yeah, why don't I get the rehabilitation before I need it? Absolutely. Yeah, that, that's basically I think the question. And Hans Ulrich, um, this mysticism obviously is connecting us to my at least new favorite project about Hildegard von Bingen. Yeah, because when we go back to this beautiful monastery um, that we just discovered, um, you have it all already there in a holistic environment. You have the plant-based environment, you have the visions, but you have also a very scientific approach that is not uh, overseeing what is invisible yet. Yeah, and I think maybe that's something that leads us to why why the you know building or growing of gardens is more important than the building of cities. And that brings us to Precious and the Garden, exactly. And of course, uh, there is a great book uh, Ben Vickers uh, published. Uh, ben Vickers has for years been obsessed by Hildegard von Bingen and has in his new publishing house actually published this book where basically it's, it's, it's co-authored by you, Lemmy, and Hildegard von Bingen. It is, a, as you know, Grace Lee Box says, we need transgenerational dialogues. And you, Lemmy, you know, works today and of course, Hildegard um, worked in the Middle Ages, but they wrote this book together. So I wanted to vividly recommend that. And indeed, uh, for this question, you know, um, about um, healing and uh, how 
basically also um, exhibitions or things which go beyond exhibitions, as we said, or architecture can contribute to that. It's of course very important to hear more about the garden pressures you did uh, with Claude and also actually um, uh, with Nicola Lees, who is the director of the Aspen Museum. Um, can you tell us a little bit about the beginnings of that and the evolution? Because of course it grew also, as far as I understand, out of an exhibition you did in Frankfurt at the MMK, because I remember that um, this exhibition opened like quite at the beginning of the lockdown and I wanted to come and then we couldn't and also we said we're going to do it after the lockdown, but then the lockdown went on and on. And so basically your piece, your installation, your very big installation was alone in the museum for many months and grew and grew and became a garden. Can you tell us about this and the story and what's happening in Aspen now? Um, so I started this um, garden of invasive and indigenous plants in Aspen, and it's kind of a space for the like fragility of like the breakdown of kind of like trying to destroy this concept of like the individual and thinking that we're separate from nature and even believing that that's a possibility is a problem in the first place when we're so interconnected to everything around us and everything we touch changes us and we change it and that's kind of why i wanted to make this space of like a garden that you walk in and even how you breathe in the garden is different like the air that you take in and how you feel rested and like how you're allowed to like rest your spirit. There's so few spaces in the world where you're allowed to actually grant yourself a moment of like rest and peace because of the constant like ferocity of the world and the way it moves. So I'm always trying to think of these like portal spaces that you can you can find yourself in the world but also out of time. Um, and for me, a garden is one of those. It's also working with things I can't control that aren't like um, past this concept of like, that become like ritual, like plants, dirt, soil, like water. It's like all these things that are so much bigger than like this concept of like humanity. And then it goes to like Sylvia Winter says, like ceremony, we have to think about past humanity into the ceremony of like everyday ritual. And that's like, I'm like, that's literally building a garden. That's like putting your hand in the soil and creating like, all of these like small microbes that go into the world and change unknowingly and then it like changes the air and changes the world and then like that's the everyday ritual like that's the magic which is like so crazy to me yeah thank you so much and i wondered also if you can talk maybe about some other spaces no or environments or structures besides the garden you've experienced that you felt you know prioritized healing mm. Um, yeah, I think it's like, for, well, in the, I made this kind of like not a garden, sort of garden thing at MMK that was a room of um, kudzu, which is like a really invasive plant in the U.S. Um, that's like not, it doesn't, it didn't have the same history in Germany, so I planted this kind of room and had these sculptures in it and then COVID happened so it got to grow for seven seven or eight months untouched or unseen by anybody else except for the people that were watering it and the air in there was like so special and like actually I think like this untouched air just made just for the plants and also the environment in there was able to like cultivate a different type of like slowness it, it really was a portal of like outside of time and it was an interesting reflection to like see like once the world stopped because in a way like everything stopped for so long and there was like a different type of flow and vibration to how we went our, about our every day and um, well, those moments also happen for me in like casual slow ways that I'm like always interrupted in the world like the other I'm in I've been doing this residency in Arl and the other day I took a long walk in the forest um, on the edge of town and I saw like six hummingbirds like congregating by a flower together and like sharing the nectar. And it's like these literal everyday like interruptions of life that I'm like, oh my God, like the entanglement and everything is so beautiful. 
it's so beautiful. I mean, uh, I, I have to mention uh, the concept, of, the the concept of Lynn Margulis and James Lovelock, the the symbiotic planet, and that we are just understanding that we are actually entangled. We are entangled on a molecular level with bacteria that we are sharing. We are actually a symbiotic organism. We are not we. We are many. Uh, every one of us is like millions, billions of uh, of bacteria coming together, living together. But there's also another entanglement that is actually happening on a quantum level. And we talked with Stefano Mancuso a lot about this, that photosynthesis, for example, won't be explainable without the quantum level and the quantum entanglement and the processes that are not happening on the molecular level, but that are happening on a much deeper physical level. And I think this understanding can come only through this kind of observation of nature. It can never come through the observation of our phone. It can come, so even the dumb phone is not dumb enough, probably, <laughs> probably only when it shuts off and gives realm to breathe. And, and that's something that uh, I would like to quasa because, uh, Precious, you were talking about breathing, and I think that's, that's a very big topic for our whole last year when, when, when we started, I think in March, uh, 29th of March in 2000, uh, we, we, we had this Wellbeing Culture Forum where you referenced, um, you know, the city, the pavement, the the violence that the city already has programmed in itself. And obviously I have to think about New York, yeah? Obviously I have to think, I mean, uh, and this is not an advertisement interruption, but I have to say that Drift is now opening a, a show in the shed uh, in New York. And probably it will be also a healing show because it's flying, you know, blocks of concrete. But sometimes you need to make the concrete fly to show the city another possibility, yes? A possibility where, you know, the air becomes visible because concrete is flying. So, uh, Tokwasa, uh, think about New York, think about our cities, thinking about everything, you know, we, we talked about. What would be your take on, uh, to bring exactly the experience Precious described um, that you can have in nature back into our cities? Well, um, one of uh, a response to that is to push away from this idea of the universal and move towards a universal sort of mindset that tends to objectify, flatten, and disappear things, and move towards the planetary and the the um, a universal that actually has to do with particles and the make of the universe. Right, and how do we um, visualize that, or how do we bring it into art form and architecture? I think is a is a really relevant question, and I my approach to it is this new idea I'm thinking about in terms of architecture of otherwise, right? So how does architecture of otherwise consider spaces that are built to support sensoria? It's built to support systems that work together with um, to support encounters um, that bring up histories of indigeneity and people who are still connected to the planet and bring up principles of technologies that have to do with digital technologies and the body as a technology, right? So how do we um, use or think about an architecture otherwise than something that flattens otherwise and something that disappears and otherwise that rejects the idea that neurological sciences, ideas of repair and ideas of architecture cannot be indelibly tied, right? So what does it mean to build new space and build new place where frankly the social sciences and the physical sciences are more indelibly tied towards liberation? Right? And thinking about this in relationship to histories of geographies of dispossession and to prioritize prevention, but also prioritize with the technologies that we have, deep repair. Right? And um, I'll just say one last thing, this idea of time and Mark Dixon's idea of like slow violence and fast violence, to really understand that time only exists because of our relationship to heat and friction, and movement, right? And if we th start thinking about architecture, this idea of otherwise, 
really brings us um, to things that are not necessarily about the measure of time, but the confrontation with the indeterminable. And then we get to the quanta, right? And then we get to real liberation, right? And then we get to methodologies that can really, um, by our development and support of them, sort of really um, respond in a way that pushes back racial capitalism, that really deteriorates the imagination, that pushes back you know, climate catastrophes that really deteriorates the imagination. Um, but that I really think that that's brain work and I really think that that's mind work. So I'm really interested in how mind maze and um, radical neurologists consider repair in relationship you know, to architecture otherwise. Thank you so much. And actually, the other day I spoke to Mantia Diavara, who also talked about this idea of care and hence a necessity for an aesthetic of solidarity. And, um, and sociality. It, and sociality, exactly. And it reminded me of uh, a conversation you and I did quite at the beginning of the lockdown. I think it was in April 2020. It was our first conversation, our first kind of public conversation. And we spoke there about this idea of care and composition, which is something you um, described actually uh, had emerged also out of your conversation with Christina Sharp. And it's, you know, now uh, more than a year later. So I was kind of very curious um, how you see today uh, this idea of composition and care, how that can contribute to healing. And also maybe if you could talk a little bit about the personal dimension of that, but then also how it can be a public and co communal healing. Absolutely. So one of the things I'm dealing with in my work is what I'm calling black compositional thought. And as this concept sort of evolves in my practice, I understand its direct connection to how we see information, right? As an abstract artist, I know that I see information in the abstract different than I see something in the didactic. So how does the brain work together to measure both um, something that is didactic, something in the abstract, in these compositional forms that people can move through and embody, right? So for example, we're sitting on these chairs that are in the round, right? So I'm really interested in this curve, right? This curve that sort of takes us beyond this kind of flat 90 degree space, but into another indeterminacy, right? So that's one thing composition as a technology can do, abstraction as a technology can do, is to compose spaces where there's a deliberate uh, moment of tension and there's a deliberate moment of release. There's a deliberate moment of you know, concrete matter and there's a deliberate moment of this softness. So black compositional thought is this idea that inherently black people who have the history of being dispossessed, brown people with the history of being dispossessed, how do you move through systems and infrastructures that are built for cruelty, that are built for dispossession, disposition, dispossession in a way that honors what the brain can do? Right? And I was thinking about this idea of composition in relationship to defenselessness, right? And what is a new kind of radical freedom is to exist with one's power without having a defense, right? So what does it mean to make a painting or a sculpture or a building without worrying about defense? You know, in that thing, having a center of power because your brain is functioning, your mind is working, your synergy is happening with all of the, you know, both in the quotidian and the phenom phenomenological, is happening in such sequence where you don't feel like you need defense. You don't have to be defensive, and your defenselessness is a, is a safe space. So how can architecture provide a defenselessness condition, right, without this idea of um, harm. So composition allows us to, um, I think, in the measurable, in the unmeasurable, live those things on our bodies, right? So. Thank you so much. I think Mikolai had the next question. Yeah, so, so I, I would basically, because it's very interesting that everybody here to, talking about the observation um, uh, and not the imposement of design, you know, so there is already a design around us actually 
uh, but we are still uh, playing a game like we would design the world. But actually what we are doing most of the time, we are destroying the world. Because the most important thing that we would design if we would go to Mars, I heard there are some people that are really working on this topic very, very intensively and believing that it makes sense. But when we go to Mars, we would need basically designing a house first and foremost, design the air supply, right? That we are not designing here because the air is already here. So the most important things that we, we are actually in need of, we are not designing because there's no need, because we have it in abundance. But what we are actually doing is we are taking it away. And we are creating this kind of what we are referring to rectangle structures that are meant already to impose violence. And I found it very interesting now introducing again uh, Francesca Kessler that uh, you are as a practitioner, I mean we, we had this meditation guidance, but you are as a practitioner of yoga um, are claiming that yoga is more about being while about making. Yeah, It's more about perceiving than about creating and maybe this is something that uh, I would like to ask you what would be from your meditational practice from your yoga practice um, your advice for designers architects um, artists maybe um, from which I, I, I think the artists here on the panel they are already having exactly this perspective but maybe you you can formulate it from from the perspective of a yoga practitioner and meditation guide. Thank you, Mikael, for asking me. Yeah, it was a long process because uh, I used to work for a long, long time as a journalist in design and architecture. So I came from outside. I was working for many years outside and then as an autodidact and uh, of questionings, I started to build spaces. That means I had to do researches for hotels and I created hotels and hotels already in the 90s. We started to think globally we, as a community, integrating art, architecture, gardens. And uh, there was um, already touched in this time uh, how far we can go and how integrate we can be working with all together. And then after a while, what everybody knows, sometimes you get lost. You get lost in success, you get lost in your minds, you get lost of over-absorbing, of over-consuming -co uh, data, uh, whatever it comes, like smartphones and whatever, and you see in between, you start you going on and on and on as a community in which you are working is a sort of splendid isolation, but you are walking, working, working, and suddenly you feel a point disconnecting. And then it starts that you're maybe feeling depressed, burnout, we say it today. So a lot of things come into your mind and the mind's getting stronger and stronger. And... Uh, is sabotating your heart, your emotion, and what starts to happen if you watch yourself, and this is what I'm doing with this program, Finding Form, also we started with students, sometimes when you watch it, it how they're sitting, how they're pulling up their, their shoulders and uh, getting closer in the heart and the feelings, and um, then they lost the breathing. And when you lose the breathing, then this easiness of breathing, you're stuck in processes. So, and then you don't know what to do, but you're creating and you're stimulating again. So you are always in consuming. So what I found out through this self-healing processes that... Of course, you do yoga and you do a detox and you do this and you travel and you find a guru. There are so many tools, but at the end, you're consuming and at the end, um, you're still alone. And you're still not aware of your breathing and integrating processes of designing, creating. So then I came up with a very easy thing breathing so it's so easy and you can take it wherever you want and you are aware and you can be connected you create a garden you feel 
you feel it, the environment in the moment you do, but you breathe with it. That means emotional breathing. So I started through breathing very easily to heal myself. And through this, I found out I can help others. So it's also to giving and start to receive and start to listening. And through listening, I got again a very quiet peace with myself and breathing. So I breathing all, all the time. We do this now when we have meetings and in architecture and buildings, which a lot of us know, which are involved with architecture or with meetings. After a while, the energy is so low in these meetings. The egos are growing. And sometimes we all lose the subject that we are all together and we want to create something together. So what we're going to do now in a new building, we did a research, um, we're doing a breathing room and we start to breathe <laughs> in several, when you feel it, in the beginning you say, wow, that's up weird and this is, but it's interesting, the people love to go before they go and start breathing together. Sometimes you even have to feel, you have to hold each other on the hands to receive something and to start to get in the same heartbeat connection. And I found this very interesting. And you can go further and further. You can do it with technique. You can do it with art. You can do it with design. You can do it with very smart brains. You can do it with a shy light. You can do it everywhere to be really connected what we are in the universe. We have to be connected. And breathing is the only thing what we all do. It's so super interesting. Thank you very much, because this is actually the description of an indigenous community, right? Where the people are living with themselves in a certain place where the microbiome is shared between them for many generations and where they are aligned, they, they are synchronized. It's like, I mean, the, this, name, the, this work's name that Lonecke gave is Shy Synchrony. And I think this kind of synchronization in a world that is now traveling again after COVID, we are meeting new people all the time and we don't even have time to synchronize. Olaf, from your perspective, how important is synchronization and can it be, you know, can, can it be created through, through environments? Absolutely. Absolutely. So again, to go back to my old friend, the buddy that I've talked uh, about before, synchrony is key to you know, moving your hand, seeing your hand moving at the same time. This is like daily stuff we have in the lab. This is a very fundamental mechanism, even for my brain to recognize that this is my hand and not, not your hand or not your hand, because there are plenty of hands in my visual field, right? So I need synchrony is huge, also for vision, for speaking, for this uh, abstract level you talked about, particularly for the didactic part, or maybe didactic gets a bit independent of, of the synchrony because I can keep things in my mind, but synchrony, Already just for all of us, even synchrony with the breathing or the heartbeat, it, the brain is monitoring this and luckily we're not aware of it. But I think meditation, art installations and architecture can make us aware of this beautiful synchrony, right? And, and I think that's something which maybe technology and architecture can, can come together to achieve and then there can obviously be a neuroscience uh, contribution there as well. But, but I think that's something that we are normally not synchronized with and some help, not everybody has, you know, to go deeply into meditation or the chance to come here to Art Basel or find those six amazing hummingbirds, right? We can't, and even if we would see them every day at the same spot, the beauty would be gone, right? So I think technology can really help us if we do it right, and I don't think nobody has the solution yet, to bring these special moments, small desynchronizations and then resynchronizing. So synchrony is a huge, huge thing in, in, in the brain, particularly for the body. And of course, resonating and being in synchrony with other humans and with nature are yet a lot of other questions. I had another question for you, which actually uh, brings it kind of to economy, because we are here, you know, at. Uh, at the fair, so I thought we should talk about economy and what kind of different economy uh, a world of care would need. Now, obviously, you know, Tim Berners-Lee, whom I interviewed a couple of years ago, who invented the World Wide Web, said that the motto of the World Wide Web is, you know, net neutrality. This is for everyone. That means access for everyone. And of course, he's extremely concerned that his invention 
is getting away from that idea, you know, and that we have a loss of net neutrality and a fast internet for people who can pay and a slow internet for people who can't pay. So he, you know, says we need to resist that. Now, at, we are on, on the brink, as you explained to us, of these extraordinary inventions your company also does of different forms of digital healing. How can we avoid that this further enhances patterns of inequality? And how can you, with your company, create, you know, healthcare for everyone? Yeah, it, it's, I, I think it really interactions soon now with governments. I think, what are human rights, right? What are fundamental human rights? If you look at that question, how much delayed we have been with the internet, right? About, about, about the, the example you gave. And I think on the neuro side, on the neurotechnology side, again, we'll be facing very fundamental neuro rights. Who has access to this kind of well-being technology? And, and I think this time... Who has time, access to breathing? To good breathing, right? The right yes, breathing. Actually, yes. Breathing. Yes. And so I think, you know, you ask a very specific question. So I think we have to be very much forward looking, much more than with the digital re revolution, right? There is another revolution coming where, where these technologies will be accessible only to a few first. And I, 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 just one example, I think the Chilean government on the neuro rights issue or neurotech has, has now separated or, or, or created something around neuro rights rather than human rights to make sure that people are aware that this is an issue that's coming. We, Chile is the only country on the world who has this. I think they will announce it soon. So Chile is pioneering that idea. Absolutely, absolutely. So, but uh, where is the UN, where is, you know, where, where the WHO and so on. That, so I think these are discussions that, um, yeah, we need to be extremely forward looking that the industry doesn't run off uh, like this, and I, but industry needs to be an important partner of these discussions as well, I Let's think. Get, get someone, Mikolai, from Chile for the next panel to discuss that. I wanted to also ask this question to everyone else on the panel, because I think it's interesting in terms also of art, you know, to think about different economies. Uh, and it's interesting, you know, Kate Ravers has written this stunning book uh, called A Donut, uh, you know, Economy. And, uh, obviously, um, The Donut, it's a great book. For those of you who haven't read it, it's for me one of the most amazing books I've, I've read over the last couple of years. Um, actually, thanks to Brian Eno, who also introduced me then to Kate Ravers. And we did, you know, we did a talk. Uh, and I've got out now with actually something trying to bring together Kate Ravers also with artists to kind of work on this donut economics. And of course, the idea is that uh, it needs a completely different economy in, you know, in the world, which means an, in, an inner ring of well-being and an outer ring that protects the life support system no, of the planet. And the economy has to function within that. The economy basically has to develop what Kate says, a safe space between planetary and social boundaries. So I just wanted to see how everybody else felt on the, you know, on the panel about that and um, how could we go towards a donut economy. I'm gonna, can I reframe that question a bit and think about the ways in which um, systems of bartering, sense of systems of exchange, and things that cannot be capitalized, how do those things get, um, I'll say, more attention within policy, right? Because capitalism doesn't exist, or this don't, these, these systems don't exist without, you know, um, systemic conditions of the thing that perpetuates um, the isolation and perpetuates models of the haves, and I'll just say the haves and have nots. And I, I just want to, before I go back to this idea of synchronicity and the, um, I'll say, the fortitude to have a condition of synchronicity within an architecture that then takes us to improvisation, right? What does it mean to establish synchronicity as a technology that then informs a kind of improvisation that does not lose its form itself, right? So I think the potential of technology that can induce a kind of synchronicity take that further and you have a kind of improvisation that really can exhaust the possibilities of what the brain and the mind can do as things that are synced. Um, 
But to now, sorry, go back in this idea of um, the capital, I I'm really have a sense of skepticism around the possibility of those systems. Um, and that, again, takes a kind of imagination that where I'm not sure we can decouple um, a kind of hyper-capitalism to even get to that kind of imagination. I'm, I'm, I'm working, trying to uh, get there. I think sociality is a way, but I'm, I'm just not quite sure uh, yet. But, but, but I think here, exactly synchronicity can be again uh, a kind of key because, you know, the free market economy at least um, is about uh, um, creating synchronicity between, for example, demand and supply, you know, so, and this is something where we are not accounting for fundamental, I believe, um, environmental needs of our own body, because this is exactly what Precious described, that uh, these hummingbirds are actually a part of her. They become a part of her because she can see the hummingbirds. So any interaction that will destroy the environment, um, because, sorry, they can see the hummingbirds, but uh, um, any interaction that will destroy this environment is actually already a destruction of something that becomes actually your body, you know? So your body and the environment is actually one. It doesn't stop uh, at the you know, surface that we recognize uh, as, as the body. So the question I think is how, because it's a very fundamental question about human rights, where is actually the, 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 the right to the habea corpus uh, the right to my own body actually is stopping. It doesn't stop with my body. It's actually already the, the air that I'm breathing in should be a part of, of, of everything that is protected. But I think the donut question is a question of um, creating something that, of course, we've never created before, which is, is, in the States anyway, which is a condition where you actually have right to breathe. And I'm not talking about clean air, I'm not talking about pollution, I'm talking about state sanctions designed that really extract the possibility of your right to breathe, police brutality, just one example. So I'm, I'm trying to get to something where it's not just kind of dealing with um, racial capitalism or dealing with the ways in which empire has built itself on you know the, the suffocation of humanity. Like how do we be, you know, skeptics now with uh, the condition of eco-catastrophe, right? So those hummingbirds, that's rare. You know, the planet is very different than it was 100 years ago, right? So, you know, honeydew is rare. You know, we can't look at, um, you know, the rain the same way anymore. So how do we, with this new condition. I, I think the hummingbirds are not rare, they are basically almost extincted. I mean, this this uh, description, Precious, was like uh, a complete, uh, it's like from a movie. Most of the people can basically experience this only through the lens, you know, of a camera that is represented on a little, you know, YouTube uh, phone screen, actually. And I, and I have to actually not agree at this one point with Olaf Blanke. I think I agree here with... Um, with Lonecke, that you can watch these hummingbirds every day and they will be never, you know, you, it will be never enough, you know, it will be always as beautiful. M maybe Lonecke, you said once this, uh, you did this distinction between watching at waves, between watching at bird swarms, you know, and the things that we are building. Can you please repeat this because otherwise I will have to repeat it and I want to do it so good as you did it. Sorry, I don't know exactly what, what you mean, what I, what I say. Yeah, I the observation of nature, yeah? what, what, why we can observe nature like waves forever without ever getting bored. Um, yeah, uh, I think because, uh, yeah, I, I said that because we, we do a lot of, hum we make a lot of human interventions uh, that we go see and we've seen it once and, and we are very much in a culture right now of seeing something once and then leave it behind. I've seen it next. And it feels like uh, never coming back to uh, a base or, or what is actually who you are. You don't need constant, you, we need new input. That's totally true. We don't need every moment a new quote or a new image or uh, it's, it's 
unsustainable and, and it makes us not look at the world anymore because we can't process all, all those things. Um, I think we can go over and over to see the sea or go over and over be in the forest or be with nature because um, yeah, because it's <laughs> it's incredible. I don't I don't I don't uh, and it's because not it's, in the building. It's never the same, right? It's it's, it's constantly changing. It is the same it is forest, the same, but, but it's changing. Understand it's living. It. You understand it on a way, and it makes you feel in a way that you belong here and you'll be part of it. And I think that is a sense that is very important for us to feel, uh, because otherwise all the rest has no meaning. That's almost like a great conclusion, because I think your installation also gave us this feeling here this morning. So uh, we're so grateful. And uh, I thought I had a last question. I thought we, because we're out of time, but I thought we should wrap it up with the last question, actually, to Precious. Because uh, the other day I spoke about care with Alexis Brown and Gams, and we discussed the importance of poetry in that, right? And um, I think we should conclude today's panel maybe with hearing a little bit about the importance of poetry in relation to this question of healing. And maybe Precious, you could tell us about that? Um, for me, I mean, poetry is like an everyday ritual of like active, like everyday life. Um, it's like, how does your life actually become the living poem? It's like these small acts of like radical care of how you interact with people like that you love. It's like changing the way that you relate with the world around you and also like everyone you meet every day. It's um, that for me, that is the poem. Like the poem is like the like love that I have with somebody that like becomes the actual poem that I write down. That's the fragment of the memory. But like what actually is the poem is the like entanglement of the everyday. And that's, that's like, for me, that's the stuff. Like that's like, that's what keeps me, that's what makes the poetry real is the everyday and like the love of the relation and the constant consent not to being a single being. Like it's like how I entangle with everybody I love. That could not be a more wonderful conclusion. So words can be an environment of healing. Pardon? Words can be an environment they, they of are. healing. Yes. <laughs> thank you so much. Thank you all so much for these amazing contributions. And thank you all so much for being here this morning with us. Thank you. Thank you.